I stand here often, I have many thoughts. One of the things I always think of, and I don't know why, is I listen for the rain on the roof. But only occasionally can you hear it. But I love the sound of rushing water. I love the sight of bodies of water. Like all of nature, I love the sight. I love the sound. I don't want to be in it. <laughs> but it's so beautiful from the car window. <laughs> or from the lounge, <laughs> enjoying a break an Easter beverage. But water, of course, is a prominent theme in this liturgy. And if we listen closely, we can hear the water. It's always a blessing. Water is always a blessing. It's always a blessing when it rains. And we have that blessing constantly here in this city. It's one of our joys. And those of you who know me, I know I'm not joking. I'm always a little sad when the sun comes out. But the rain and the water remind us then of these scriptures. And if we listen closely, we can hear the roaring of the waters from all eternity. And that's the glory of liturgy. It's not a time. It's not an hour or three. Uh, it's eternal. It's water, that sound of water that echoes not just on the roof now, but throughout eternity. When God separated the land and the waters and formed then the sky over the earth. When Moses stretched out his hand and separated the Red Sea. When Jonah finally rose out of the sea after three days in the belly of a whale. When the sight of Christ was pierced and blood and water poured forth from his side. These are the things we hear in this liturgy, in this moment, these moments in the lives of our spiritual ancestors, our spiritual brothers and sisters. The sound of water was so important for them. It signified life or danger in the desert. But those who experienced it most profoundly would never hear the sound of rain or the sound of rushing waters in the same way again. After the flood, Noah would never hear rain in the same way. After the crossing of the Red Sea, Moses and his people would never hear the sound of the ocean in the same way again. Jonah would never look at the sea in the same way. And equally those at the foot of the cross, the centurion, Mary the mother of God, John the apostle, would hear water falling upon the ground, water and blood, in a whole new way. Every year, at this liturgy, we pray, and we remember the flood and the crossing of the Red Sea. The flood mentioned in, in Genesis early on, that flood which we see from one perspective, we always see from the front side. We see that there was sin upon the earth, and the Lord spoke to Noah and said, that you need to build this ark. You need to enter it with all of these animals. Which, I'm glad I wasn't Noah, because there you are bringing in, outside in. But that's another story. All of this, why? To make something new. Or Moses then fleeing from his enemies and bringing his whole people with him. What do these things mean? We often overlook the flood. Even in the Catholic tradition, for those who see it as a myth. But we can't miss its truth. The flood signifies that first purification of the earth. It symbolizes the baptism of the world. That sin and evil are drowned, yes, 
and they're submerged in these waters, these waters which we also recall in the 40 days of Lent. The 40 days of Lent represent the 40 days of Christ in the desert, but also the 40 years, or rather the 40 days of the flood, as well as the 40 years of the Israelites in the desert. We know that the ark becomes an image of the church. It is preserved from death. And the dove flying over the waters not only represents then the Holy Spirit, but the gift of life. And he brings this branch full of sap, like the oil that will flow upon the Jewish people, upon David, and upon the holy people of Christ in the church, the oil of salvation in the gift of the Holy Spirit, in the sacred chrism, which we will anoint those who be baptized and confirmed this evening. The anointing of Christ, brought forth from a world submerged in water, brought forth from death, this sign over the whole universe that the Lord would bring about salvation. An old hymn from the 6th century speaks of the piercing of Christ, the wound on his side. And one translation reads thus, There the nails and spear he suffers, vinegar and gall and reed, from his sacred body pierced. Blood and water both proceed, precious flood, which all creation from the stain of sin has freed. The hymn makes this connection This ancient Christian hymn makes the connection with the flood in the ancient world to the flood of grace and of mercy flowing forth from the side of Christ. We're so accustomed to floods being a bad thing, to being an evil thing, but that was not always so in the ancient world. In one of our Catholic traditions, the the patriarch among the Coptic Christians One of his titles is Razor of the Nile, which they borrow from the pharaohs of old. The Coptic patriarchs take on those old titles. Razor of the Nile, because by the prayers of the patriarch, the prayers of their head bishop, that the waters of the Nile would come forth and nourish the land, that there might be life. In the ancient world, when we were not so settled in one place, and had all of our possessions then in our basement or ground floor. The waters of the flood were a blessing that, yes, caused destruction, that, yes, was dangerous. But when they withdrew, they left behind grace. They left behind nutrients to nourish the plants, to give food to the people that they might live. If it did not flood often enough, There might be suffering and death. It becomes a grace. And so in our prayer today, when we bless the water, we will hear this line, O God, who by the outpouring of the flood foreshadowed regeneration, so that from the mystery of one and the same element of water would come an end to vice and the beginning of virtue. As the waters flow over Egypt or flowed over the the Holy Land, the Middle East, in those days of Noah. So Christ, the flood that comes from the side of Christ, his blood, the blood and water of his mercy, pour forth to nourish us, to cover us over with the death he experienced, that he might take away vice and sin, death and darkness, sin and destruction within us, and leave behind the nutrients, the nourishing presence of his most precious blood. This is the baptism which Paul speaks about that we have undergone. We didn't have water merely poured on us in a way of cleansing. Rather, our baptism, and indeed every time we enter that renewal of baptism in the vows we take and renew this day, or in the sacrament of penance, that those floodwaters come rushing in. 
the blood and water that pour forth from the side of Christ flow into our own hearts and wipe away those sins and death and leave behind the life and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is how we should hear these stories of water in our liturgy today. Moses, do not look at poor Moses when he leads his people into the Red Sea. And I'm sure they were still uncertain. For at the end, when they cross over, God speaks to him again. And he says, now the Lord will show his power in the face of your enemies, in the face of Egypt. And Moses stretches out his hand again, and they are saved. And it's in that they rejoice, and they sing this hymn of praise to God. They would never forget And the scripture says that it is because of that that they believe in God. They believe in his power. This, too, is likened to the cross, where the blood and water pours forth and those at its foot believe because they recognize the sign that sign of one who has suffered so much and he now is dead upon the cross gives forth the signs of life, blood, and water. These things are likened to the tomb also. The tomb, if you enter a tomb and is shut or a cave, you can hear sounds outside, the echoing of things upon the walls. It sounds a little bit like an ocean, as if it was was a crab and crawled into a shell. You can hear the sounds that are like water. So our Lord then buries himself in this tomb, just like his people before him, this tomb that is this ark, this tomb that is like the Red Sea, this tomb like is the whale that swallows Jonah. And yet, like them, he emerges, dry shot, risen from the dead. In the events of the Triduum, we see two things. We see then the love of Christ that we've reflected on these past two days the love of Christ for us. But we see also in his resurrection what it means to be united with Christ. To be united with him in his suffering and his cross means to know the glory of the resurrection, to die with him, to die to the world, to die, as he says, for the sake of one's friends. We live. Losing ourselves, we find life. And we rejoice then in the gift of his grace that he has given us. In this moment, then, we can hear, we hear more clearly this night the voice of our ancestors, the voice of praise of the Israelites upon the sea and the roaring of the waters as it came back in, as the walls of water broke forth and all the water came roaring back to its place. We can hear the waters of the flood and even as Noah's the point probably of despair. Finally, the dove comes back with this, this piece of olive branch. Or like Mary Magdalene, who in her sadness, her despair, her loss, is drowning in her sorrow, is raised up by the voice of the one who planted the Garden of Eden, the true gardener, Jesus Christ. And she not only hears his voice, but in that moment, grace illumines her mind and her eyes, and she sees too and believes in the risen Christ. May the sounds of these waters, echoing from ancient days or in this baptismal font today, Remind us then of the blood and water that pour forth from the side of Christ. 
that precious, precious flood which all creation has been cleansed by from the stain of sin and has been freed. May we know that freedom. May we know that joy in the gift of the blood and the water poured forth for us, that witness to the central and most important aspect of our Christian faith and of each one of our lives, that Christ is risen from the dead.